Welcome to the latest Pinnacle Forum podcast on stewarding the influence that God has given you. This is a series of conversations with leaders who happen to be Christians. Many are fellow partners and are also currently involved in one of our forums. As leaders in our fields, we gain influence. We may think that our influence came because of our intellect, our looks, our luck, our personality, and it's for our own use. The reality is that God grants this for us to use in the advancement of his kingdom. These are the stories of people who are learning how to use that God-given influence in service to others and ultimately to God. We trust these will encourage you as you steward your own God-given influence. Now on to our discussion. I've got a, a repeat guest today. Her name is Terry Lynn Miller. Terry's had an interesting journey, uh, well, all of her life, but especially the last couple of years she's going to tell us about. She has been on a podcast before, so if you want more information about Terry, uh, Terry Lynn from before, uh, just look that up on our website. And uh, she's going to give us a little bit more insights that she's gleaned now from her early days um, and then some of the journey that she's going through now. Uh, take it away, Terry. <laughs> It is so fun to be back here. I was so nervous last time. I hope that I'm not quite so nervous this time. There's so much in my heart that I would love to share today. You asked me to begin with a little bit of my past, and I think the most relevant piece to bring forward to why Pinnacle Forum matters to me in my life the way it does is that um, the household that I was born into is very typical today, but I don't know if it was so typical when I was a child. My mom had a son and my dad had a son and they got married and they had me. So both of my brothers were eight years older than me. They were four months different in age, but I didn't know they were half brothers until I was, oh, I don't know, third, fourth grade, somewhere in that area of time, I would suspect because their parents, their biological parent um, had stepped out of their lives completely. So there wasn't visitation or anything like that. Well, no, wait a minute. You've got two brothers that are, um, you're in third grade, so you're eight years old. They're 16. You celebrate their birthdays with them. You know that they're the same age and four months apart. By third grade, you've probably got some idea about the gestation period for human beings. Well, I hadn't figured it out, but okay. how the whole... <laughs> Like, I don't All even right. know if I realized they were in the same grade. I mean, they look so different. I don't, I, I, you know, I just, they're my brothers. And they were, when they're eight years older than you, they've got their own little life going on. They're yeah. teenagers. And so, that's a good question. Yeah, I was studying. Yeah. So I, I will tell you a funny story that, that goes well with that is that my brother uh, was turning 17, uh, one of them. So my mother's son was turning 17 and uh, wanted to go into the military. And uh, he was a little young for that. And he wanted to go in as a Hancock. He wanted the name he'd grown up with that wasn't legal. He wanted, you know, the, he was my mom's son. He wanted the Hancock name, my dad. And so they legally adopted each other's sons. So I'm trying to figure this out. Wait a minute. You guys are adopt. What? You're adopt. Wait. Well, who's adopting me? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be adopted. <laughs> I'm adopted, right? You know, and I'm trying to figure all this out. And my brother Danny, the one that wanted to go in the military, they were Danny and Robbie. It was Danny, Robbie, and Terry. They would shorten it to Terry, right? And so it was. It was cute. But uh, anyway, he said to me, "You were hatched from an egg. You don't need adopted." I was hatched from an egg wait a minute, you know, and it just every question I asked, he had some ridiculous answer for it. And I was just in such a conundrum of trying to figure out what's this adoption stuff? What they're half brothers? What does that even mean? And by the way, I want to know who's adopting me. And so that's how that went. That's the, but, the mind of a nine year old. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I just uh, anyway, and so why is that relevant to today? Because I soon became very aware that, wait a minute, the only thing these guys all share in common is me. 
And like biologically, I am connected to all four, but they are not biologically connected to each other. So I'm the common ground. Mm. And I had always been this peacemaker in the family. The brothers would be fighting and I'm like trying to figure out how to get them all calm. And mom and dad could have spats and trying to figure out how to get them calm. And they'd have spats with the kid, with my brothers. And I'm just this little girl running around that's really young and uh, watching these adults in my life uh, and trying to figure out how to get them to play nice in the sandbox. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, so, But that is kind of that. Well, that's a character trait. Yeah, I, I started realizing that People who are very different can actually be a family together if you figure out how to be nice to one another and respect who each other is, which became a skill in my life. That's a that's a fascinating insight with what you and I just talked about before we started the podcast, because fast forward a number of years and you're working for the governor of Arizona in a very politically charged environment with left and right and everything is going on and your job was... I was the director of faith and community initiatives for Governor Ducey. And there's a lot of different ideas about faith and community initiatives from left and right. And you're trying to get everybody to play together. It sounds familiar. Uh, (laughs) Name a success that you had. Oh, you know, one of the things that we talked about last time was I felt that I was in this season of transition. I knew the governor and I worked very closely with the first lady that, you know, their time was short and I was trying to figure out our next steps. And when God brought me to the governor's office, in all honesty, I didn't want to go. I thought who in their right mind goes into a political world and thinks that they're going to survive right? <laughs> like, or make any difference, you know? <laughs> and so, but my work that I had been doing prior to that, a nonprofit organization was really helping our most vulnerable and understanding the neuroscience of trauma and why as Christians, we needed to understand the brokenness in the world and how to help people with that trauma-informed understanding. And it was very new. It was, a, it was just an emerging kind of just starting to be known by people. And I was an early adapter in that conversation. And I knew that if God, because I told him, no, three times, I'm not going to go to the governor's office. I don't want this job. It's too scary. And on the third time I said, no, God said, you haven't asked me. And I hit my knees. Hmm. And I was like, I don't want to (laughs) go. It's going to be hard. And uh, I don't know why I had that fear. I guess watching everyone fight. I hate fighting. It just undoes me. (laughs) And always has. It always has since I was a kid, Uh, you know, and now that you've got the other part of the story, right? Conflict. How do we deal with conflict? But I knew God had me there for one reason. And that was the work I'd been doing on this trauma informed that we needed to know this. And that was the information, the knowledge that I had that actually was exactly why God had me there. And it didn't take long to realize that that it was true. Our first lady, Angela Ducey, was on her way to a governor's spouse's yearly event that that they hold. And the state of Wisconsin was becoming a trauma-informed state. And she wanted to know what is Arizona doing in this regard. And I knew. I was very grassroots. I knew who the people were. I knew who the connections, you know, all that. And so I was able to put together a briefing And eventually others were on the team and helping with all the work. It wasn't just all, it's always about team that makes these beautiful things happen. But she went to that event with briefing that told her everything beautiful and wonderful that was happening in Arizona around this trauma-informed care movement. And she came back determined that Arizona was going to become a trauma-informed state. And so I was able to be on the grassroots level of watching changes happen on a statewide level in collaboration with people who don't always see eye to eye, but they could see eye to eye on the brokenness that is in people and how we can help one another be the best version of themselves. Okay. So what does it mean to be a trauma-informed state? Okay. So it's everything. So here's different ways in which we brought that to be. And there actually was a kickoff event for Arizona becoming a trauma-informed state. And that was at your 
boots on the ground level training. How do you get the nonprofits that are out there serving on board, aware, informed? Part of that is through providing trainings. Part of that is through encouraging them through grants, that type of thing. On board yes. and aware of what? And aware of the way the physiology in our bodies of what happens when someone has profound adversity. So there was training on um, the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. How does that impact our children in the foster care system or the parents who are trying to take care of them? What about substance abuse? How often is substance abuse just a way of coping? And so beginning to understand what is going on, to be trauma-informed is to, and it's a whole concept and topic, but um, you can truly just look up trauma-informed. There's so much information on it now, but it's, I would say that at its heart, it's kind of how Jesus functioned in so many ways. You think about when he caught the woman, you know, when the, the woman in adultery, that story, you know, his first response to her wasn't go and sin no more. His first response was to create safety and then have a conversation with her and then touch her heart and then say, here's the way. And that, that is a beautiful example of a trauma informed heart. Uh, it's how we treat one another. It's how we be kind. It's how we, when someone's having a really off day <laughs> and they're losing it, that we stay calm. We choose to stay calm so that we can help them physiologically reground, rebalance, take some breaths, uh, and get back on track. Our frontal cortex of our brain, it shuts down when it goes into fight or flight, doesn't think straight. So we're wanting people that are in great distress to make wise decisions, but we got to deal with the distress first. We've got to bring them to a state of safety and calm so they can think it through and make right choices. It's common sense. It's ancient wisdom. It's just putting it together in a way in which we understand it in today's world, that this is how we love one another and love one another well. All right. So that role ended. It kind did. So I do want to tell you, can I answer one more question there? So, so you asked, how do you make a state trauma informed? Mm -hmm. And I talked about the training for the um, for your people out there already serving and wanting to make a difference and making sure that they have the best tools and the best understanding to do that and the funding to make it happen. That's on the boots and the ground level. On your other side is policy, and then you have your state agencies. So those agencies that your prison, your Department of Child Safety, your Department of Economic Security, your different departments, right, that are dealing with human need, you get them on board too. And so there was, there was a cabinet meeting and these directors of these agencies said, we're willing to go down that road. Yes, we will do this. We will get the training. We will begin to pass it on to our employees. And the, the beautiful demonstration of that, this trauma-informed movement uh, over the years, this wasn't just a one-day thing, was when the Department of Corrections became the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation and Reentry. Like, how do we look at the whole person, not just punish, but try to get this person back on track? Because then they're going to go home and be better moms, better fathers, raise their kids because they're the ones that should be raising their kids, right? And it may be too late, but they can be better people and we can get them there. So that's the big picture. That's a, how a whole state, and it's a big state, and it's talking to a lot of people and bringing a lot of people together and having conversations and getting them on board. Uh, my role was to go to churches and get them on board, you know, go to faith-based nonprofits and get them on board and have those conversations with those leaders and say, if you really want to see people have success when they're reaching out and ministering to someone, this is key. This is key. But what does that look like for a church congregation? It looks like a lot of different things. It can be that you start with your staff and have someone come in who who is, um, I call them faith friendly or of your faith or, you know, that kind of thing that knows this already, uh, this information and do some 
leadership kind of training. Do you look for trauma to try to help your staff get over it? Would that be the idea? You want them to be aware. The first thing is just create awareness. You don't just start. I I don't think you just start off with unless someone's stating that they need some help with this is how you change yourself. I think for me, when I had my aha moment that got me in this realm of trying to, how do we help people and not hurt them or get, or for those who are outside the walls of the church already serving, discouraged because people keep going back to the challenges and struggles that they had. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And so awareness is to begin to really the brain science of it, the average child experiences piece of it how you're becoming informed, you're becoming aware, you're learning about it. And you can make some changes to your reactions to people and start realizing, whoa, I can, I'm, I'm getting upset. I need to recognize this as this person uh, who's dysregulated would be the word. The word they're struggling. I'm going to step back. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to stay calm and I'm going to be safe for this person that's having a meltdown. And so it kind of just began with that. It's a process. Uh, becoming trauma sensitive is now a common way in which it's expressed. So you it's start with staff, get some people in the church that are interested in it, they're already serving, share it with uh, this information. There's so much available now. I mean, when it was grassroots, it was grassroots. There was no material. We were creating material. Now the material's out there by so many. But, but it seems like, Okay, so I had some trauma. I've learned to live with it. I've dealt with it, and I've moved on. And now you want to scratch this scab and bring it all up again, and I just assume not. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. I think it's dangerous to bring up uh, someone's past trauma and not not have a plan for what that's going to look like. One of my fears is that, you know, when you're in a group and you're doing training, it triggers old memories. And so part of the training is if you feel yourself unraveling, I had an experience where I was in a, fortunately I wasn't at the council table itself. I was just attending a meeting, but I might, I like, I just lost it. And because what I was hearing was just too close to past painful experiences Mm -hmm. that clearly were unresolved. It's those past painful unresolved issues that that are, that are ones that'll bubble to the surface. And so to create a safe space for any of those individuals it's in, in a training or whatever you start at the beginning to to really talk about if you start feeling you know if you need to go outside and take a walk if you if you whatever like you know there's people here that can talk to you afterwards that kind of thing that you're creating an environment where they know that they could get upset and that you're there for them and that you will help them walk through that so that's why you start with training your staff and you you keep it there. This isn't a this isn't a thing where you learn it and now you do it. This is a thing where you learn it and you begin to try it and develop it as almost just part of who you are and how you um, engage with people. It's not just a class and then you have the knowledge. It has to be absorbed. It has to become more and more just how you live life. So God okay? uh, got to the point where He was done with you in that office. Yes, yes. And he let you know because they said <laughs> it was, we don't it need was, you anymore. <laughs> it is it is the typical political way to go. You know, and I get it. You know, I've been battling cancer for for quite a while and it was a recurrence and it really disrupted my life and any plans that I had and we had a change of leadership in the middle, you know, election and we had change of it was just a big change for the state of Arizona and but I was in the middle of treatments. And when I rolled from short-term to long-term disability, the new leadership who had no idea who I was or what I could do gave me that option. You can resign or terminate, you know, and um, it's so I, 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 it's forced resignation, but it did shake me a little bit. But I understood that they probably needed someone to start doing that work. And I was just, um, it was taking me a while to heal. So you were busy battling cancer. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how that's going? Yeah. So I rang the bell. <laughs> so I'm done with all the treatments. Now it's just healing from all the treatments, but it was a recurrence. And uh, it was a memorial weekend um, a year, 
more than a year ago. Um, so it took about a half a year and a half to get through all the treatment. There was such a wide variety of ways that they wanted to go after it because it was a recurrence. Um, but I realized Memorial Weekend that my cancer was back. I had nodules. I could feel them. And they came back so fast. I had a, every three months I went in for a checkup. And in three months' time, they went from no nodules to nodules. <laughs> so it's just like, dang it. <laughs> dang it, dang it, dang it. Very. And so I get it. You know, there's no hard feelings there. And I had been praying that did God want me to stay in it? Or, or not it, it, in an environment that was, I didn't agree with everything. There was so much. And we're talking about this, this gift that God gave me to be able to be between two very opposing sides and say, I think mm -hmm. there's ways we can work together. And here's what it looks like. And uh, which is how Arizona became a trauma state. Everybody got on board. It just made sense. And we kept it safe for everyone. But um, anyway, I knew that I was going to be entering as, uh, you know, that we were going to have a change in leadership. I didn't know if it was Republican to Republican or Republican to Democrat or what that was going to look like, but I knew it was coming. And usually leadership wants to pick their own people. And so right. I knew my days were numbered. The last time I spoke with you, I was really trying to figure out what's the next season going to be for Terry Lynn. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. And at that time, I didn't feel really free to speak too much about my work because because we are a divided world and I didn't want something that I said to cause any grief to um to a governor and his wife who I cared very much for and uh, was so appreciative of everything that they were doing so I said nothing <laughs> about it but um I do want to celebrate Mrs. Uh, our first lady Angela Ducey she was remarkable and she did fabulous work making sure our kiddos in the foster care system were well taken care of that we had a plan to keep them with their parents and that didn't work, that we had supports for those foster care families. You know, if those kids ended up aging out, that they had a place to go. And uh, she did a beautiful job. So you've walked through some difficult uh, trauma of your own in the last couple of years. Talk about, how Pinnacle Forum impacted you as you were going through what you went through? Yeah, I'll try not to tear up. And Mitchell, by the Sorry. way, you're, you're, you're cancer free now. You're you're ringing the bell. It's it's, it's so. This you. is how it goes with the type of type of cancer that I have. They want you to make it five years, then it really is a, a true cancer free. So they say you're in remission. So okay. I was in remission three years before it came back. And now they've just hit me with everything they could hit me with. And so the prayer is, is that I get to that five years and I'm like, <laughs> so, five years after the first three or five years, did the clock start again? The clock started again. Yeah. So it start it starts today. It well, it started on the, the third when I rang that bell. Mm. So I got five years, but okay. we're having a big party in five years. Um, but anyhow, um, <laughs> I've earned that party. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who's gone through cancer or watched it know that it's, hard work. Um, what was your question? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Talk about how your, your, your experience with Pinnacle Forum going through that. Ah, oh, yes. I was going to cry. That's what was happening. That's right. Um, don't cry. Yes. But cry if <laughs> but you I'm going to, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I've got my composure now. I believe so much in the, the whole principle of Pinnacle Forum in that we don't always find relationships that we can connect to deeply and closely in our Bible studies, especially if your work, you see it as kingdom work. Where, where are those other people that are doing kingdom work that need kingdom support, trying to have influence in these different cultural mountains and everyone's got a mountain or two <laughs> like, and how do we support one another and encourage one another? And I always believed that to support Pinnacle Forum, it was, you weren't supporting Pinnacle Forum as a nonprofit organization to get something out of it. You were supporting Pinnacle Forum, a nonprofit organization to give to a concept that needed life breathed into it over and over and over again, because the people that are in the forums are doing unbelievable work for the kingdom and they know it. And so I joined for that reason, to be around like-minded people trying to have kingdom impact who needed to have a safe place. 
I needed a safe place. At working at the governor's office, I needed to know that whatever I said stayed in that conversation, never right. to be shared, so that I could have a meltdown on those hard days because I was right when I told God the three times, I don't want to be here, that it was never an easy journey. It wasn't that I wasn't loved or treated well. It's a hard environment. In and of itself, it's toxic just by nature, even in the best environment. And so then cancer comes along. And I discovered that there was a group of women who we've been with now for a few years who prayed me through and carried me through cancer when I was just so frustrated or overwhelmed. They were there and they blessed me in a wide variety of ways. And I'm really excited because tomorrow we're going to all get together and someone's flying in for it. We're going to celebrate some birthdays, but also celebrate that I rang the bell. And I came to, to realize that this group was a gift and wildly necessary in my journey with cancer. That I needed someone that wasn't my family or a Bible study at church or, you know, it, someone who could carry a heavy load with me and be willing to do that week after week after week after week after week. You know, tragically, we've seen, or I've seen four or five close friends within forums um, struggling and passing the last couple of years. One right now that it's a partner in Northern California that is losing a battle with a brain tumor. And um, I saw him a couple of weeks ago, and he could sit up in a wheelchair, and he had the use of his right hand, and we sat at his kitchen table and ate a sandwich together mm -hmm. that his wife had fixed. That was two weeks ago today, and today he is bedridden, can't get out of bed, um, and his wife sees him deteriorating every day. And I've seen how his forum has loved on him and tracked his progress and been in contact with his wife, and it's it's amazing to watch because that doesn't happen very often. People die alone in a, in a hospice environment with some, maybe hopefully some family around them, but um, there's there's not a lot of deep deep relationships that are that are out there that are available that are that, that you can find anywhere, and that's that's one of the things that I really really cherish about Pinnacle Forum is is the relationships that that I've formed with people that, that will cause me to drive across the state to go spend an hour with somebody um, that I wouldn't have. You know, that's kind of a measure of the depth of the relationship is I've got to go see that person, even if it means an airplane flight. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I know what you're talking about, that, that depth of relationship that, that you, very few people have. And very few people have ever experienced it. You don't experience it in Typically, in my experience, you haven't. I haven't experienced it in a in a church home group or a Sunday school class or even a deacons meeting, like you do in a, in our forums. It's it's pretty amazing. I think it's the intentionality of the forums. I have some dear friends that I've known since I was in grade school that um, we text each other back and forth and pray for one another, and it's beautiful. And I have beautiful friendships. I'm blessed. My life is beautiful and abundant. But what made the forums different is that it's every week. It's a set time. It's a commitment. And you're there over and over and over and over again for one another. And we all go through trials. You know, it, we, you, you may carry someone through theirs. And then next thing you know, they're carrying you through yours because we there is suffering in this world mm -hmm. and we do not escape it and we are meant to learn and grow from it and uh, we can't learn and grow from it in isolation it is truly when we have people around us to love and nurture and care for us while we go through it the true beauty happens so you've rung the bell what next <laughs> still in transition and, and i don't know is an okay answer i I have no idea. You know, I it kicked my fanny. I got brain fog galore, so I have no idea if I made any sense today or not, right? I'm just being raw and real there. <laughs> like, and um, 
and I'm just so tired. But God knows. And I don't know if all that work and knowledge that I have with trauma-informed stuff will ever be used. I've got people telling me I should write a book. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with that. But anyway, yeah, I even got a title, but I don't see myself doing that either. It just seems like too much hard work. So I think what I have learned in this journey is that I am a doer. And I think that my identity and my worth comes from what I can accomplish. And God has allowed me to accomplish some amazing and beautiful things. But he is teaching me in this long season of transition and that being and being present for him to work through me, however he wants to work through me, is enough. In fact, it's more than enough. And so I have settled into that reality. I stopped kicking and screaming and thinking I needed to find something to do and just say, God, this day's a gift and it's yours. We've got a partner who wrote a book called Plan B. Mm. B E. <laughs> Love it. I'll have to read that. That sounds awesome. <laughs> it, it really is quite good. Yeah. That may not be the whole title. Anyway. Well, Terry, it's been a it's been a pleasure um, uh, keeping in touch with you and, and hearing your progress. And I'm so pleased about the bell ringing. We'll be watching for the next five years. Big party. <laughs> so darn, start the clock over again. I was hoping it was cumulative, and then in two years it put you there. But for the five years, and see how God uses you uh, as your being, what He wants you to be, and um, I'm sure He's got. Uh, some amazing plans. We always Thank does. you for being my guest today and for sharing uh, your life and your trials with us. Um, it's always uh, amazing to hear uh, life is full of suffering. And uh, for the person in, in today's forum who said, uh, no, everything's good. I don't need anything to pray about. Look out at your, your, your turn is coming. <laughs> it does catch up with you. Not to scare anyone. Just, Not to scare anybody, but it's coming. Yeah. Your turn is coming. coming. Yeah. yeah. This was wonderful. Well, Thank you. So from all of us uh, uh, here, uh, Terry, Terry Lynn and I and, and Pinnacle Forum, thank you for listening. We trust that the stories of, of our partners and what they're doing to steward the influence that God has given them. Um, is a uh, encouragement to you as you uh, try to steward the influence that God has given you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>